Two weeks from now, on August, the evening of August 5th until August 6th, is going to be the seventh new moon in God, on God's calendar, in his calendar year. And so what that means is that it's going to be the Festival of Trumpets. And since I have this document open, I will go ahead and let you know that on the 15th will be the Day of Atonement. Remember that God's day God's days begin in the evening. So if I say that the 15th is the Day of Atonement, what I mean is that the evening of the 14th begins the Day of Atonement until the 15th, until that evening, which then would begin the next day. And then the 20th will begin the first day of the Festival of Tabernacles, the 27th will be the last day of the Festival of Tabernacles. Why is that important? Because we assemble on the first and the last day. So those will be the seventh month festivals for this year. Now, we used to call them the the fall festivals, but the word doesn't refer them to them as the fall festivals. That's something that we learned in counterfeit Christianity. But upon leaning in and studying uh, what God has actually established and observing these festivals, God has made clear that he has date-specific festivals and he has season-specific festivals. He does not have two calendars, as Reformed Judaism is claiming. He has one calendar that he established, and that is based on the moon. It's based on the new moon. It's based on the biblical new moon. So at that time, the new moon would have been when the moon showed up and was new when there was a crescent, not a dark moon. Science changed the new moon to, to the dark moon. So this should just follow logic. When you set, when something shows up, you think, oh, that's new. And then when it turns dark, you think, oh, it's gone, right? That's just, that follows logical sense. Now we know on a 360 day calendar, 30 day month, 12 months in a year, that God's date-specific holy days are going to land on every season of the year. They're not going to be at the same time every year like you could say, well, December's always going to be in winter, where I live anyway. You're not going to correlate God's months with the seasons because that's not what he established. That's what we become accustomed to because we become accustomed to prostituting ourselves to the ways of the Romans and their Gregorian calendar. So those are the dates for this year as they correlate to the Gregorian calendar. They will not be the same next year. You will not be able to look at uh, the Gregorian calendar and say, oh, well, it's going to be, you know, the seventh month new moon is going to be on August 6th and the Day of Atonement will be on the 15th. You won't be able to do that because the Gregorian calendar is 365 days and God's calendar is based on the moon, 360 days, which actually equate to 354 12-hour days. I've talked about it in other videos. I know that it sounds wacky, but I've also proven it to you based on scripture. That is the way that he established it. So if it's weird to you, it's not because... It's inherently weird. It's because we have been prostituting ourselves to the ways of the world. In this particular video, I want to talk with you about the significance of the Festival of Trumpets. Now, you've probably heard in Counterfeit Christianity that the Festival of Trumpets is when Jesus is returning. Um, so what happened to what the Word said about not knowing the day or the hour? We can know the year, we can know the general time, but we don't know the day or the hour. But if Jesus is returning on the Festival of Trumpets, then we would know the day. If we know ahead of time that he's going to return on the, Festival of Trump on, on, on the Festival of Trumpets, then we're going to know the day. But God said we don't know the day or the hour. Just like I pointed out to you that people who carnally approach God's word are always trying to figure things out like, like God is a mystery or a puzzle to be figured out. God's giving you his word. And he's given you his word because he wants you to understand it. It's not like a riddle that you need to continually, you know, try to crack the code. What you do is you rend your heart to God and you have a relationship with his Holy Spirit. And then he reveals these things to you. So that's what we're going to do in this video. We're going to study what is the significance of trumpets. Why did God establish trumpets? The first context that I see in scripture is in Exodus when it says, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. 
Everyone in the camp trembled. Okay, so we know what this is. This is when God spoke to the Israelites. And that's the first context in Exodus 19 where God's voice and his presence are being described with thunder and lightning, which is consistent throughout the word, particularly thunder. And now we see that there's a trumpet also being used in order to describe God's voice or his presence. In Revelation 8, the first four trumpets are actually warnings from God. And so even though these angels are sounding those trumpets, we can also understand that it doesn't literally have to be the voice of God, but that the voice of God or the call of God is represented in that, in him calling us in. Again, in verse 19, it says, as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Exodus 20, verse 18, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. Okay, as I read this, I think this really is just representing like the presence of God, the announcement of his presence. Then in Leviticus 23, 23, it says, the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites on the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a day of Sabbath rest, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blasts. Do no regular work, but present a food offering to the Lord. It doesn't really tell us much there, except that we're to have a day of Sabbath rest and we're to do no regular work and we are to sound the trumpets. And it says trumpet blasts, plural. So obviously we need to understand what do trumpets mean to God? In what context did he use these trumpets? Leviticus 25, nine, then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Okay, so this is an announcement. On God's holy days, he has us sound these trumpets. He also has us sound trumpets over our offerings. There's a sort of announcement. Numbers 10.1. Now here, God establishes with Moses that he wants for him to make two silver trumpets. And there are going to be two separate signals, one for calling the Israelites in and the other for sending them out. Let's read about it. The Lord said to Moses, make two trumpets of hammered silver and use them for calling the community together and for having the camp set out. When both are sounded, the whole community is to assemble before you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. If only one is sounded, the leaders, the heads of the clans of Israel, are to assemble before you. When a trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the east are to set out. At the sounding of the second blast, the camps on the south are to set out. The blast will be the signal, the signal for setting out. To gather the assembly, blow the trumpets, but not with the signal for setting out. So this is to organize the Israelites to have this universal understanding among them of what they are to do. It establishes a relationship between the person blowing the trumpet and those who are hearing it, doesn't it? So when God blows a metaphorical trumpet, should we understand what he's communicating? Should we understand whether he's telling us to set out or come in, whether to return to him? Well, let's see. Let's see if God established something like that. Second Chronicles 7.13 When I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered at this place. I've chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Well, what does it have to do with a trumpet? He's saying, when I send these things to the earth, this is what you're supposed to recognize. This is the communication that I'm establishing with you so that you recognize that I have blown a trumpet, that I am speaking to you, and that when I'm speaking to you in this way, that you return to me and humble yourself and that you repent. And then, because you have listened to me, I will listen to you. My heart will always be here. My eyes will be attentive to this place. Well, how am I coming to the conclusion that these are trumpets, that, that that's a trumpet, that that has anything to do with trumpets that God is speaking about? Let's go to Revelation 8. 
Verse 6, Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down to the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned to blood, a third of the living creatures died. Okay, you get the picture? Let's go back to Second Chronicles 7, 13. What did he say? So these are trumpets that are being blown. Those are the things that are happening. And in Second Chronicles 7, 13, God said, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. Oh, that's how... It's like a trumpet. It's God's communication. He's announcing something. He's letting you know his presence is near. He's letting you know that you need to return. Trumpets one through four were signals that you should have understood. You should have been able to see the things that God was sending to the earth and say, oh, it's time to return. When God sent COVID, what did you do? What was your response? Did you look at it and think, Okay, I think God's doing something right now, and I need to understand what he's doing. Or were you one of the ones who was saying, I can't wait till things go back to normal? Did you recognize it as a call to return, as something that God established in his word? When I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague, COVID, among my people... If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways... That's the covenant, guys. That's the relationship he established with you. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive, forgive their sin and will heal their land. So if you do those things when he's sending these things and you recognize that it's time to return to God, that the reason he's sending these things is that his people have gotten too far. If you acknowledge him and you return to him, then he's going to hear from heaven and he will forgive your sin and heal your land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I've chosen and consecrated this temple. You're the temple now. This was the first temple, but you're the temple now. So that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. So God has, in essence, established these trumpets in order to have a relationship with you. The one blowing the trumpet for the Israelites to come in or to set out is having a relationship with the Israelites. From wherever they are, they don't have to be right in front of them. They don't even have to see them face to face. They blow the trumpet and it's understood what they must do. When God blows a trumpet, it needs to be understood what you must do. Back to Numbers 10, verse 8. The sons of Aaron, the priests, are to blow the trumpets. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you and the generations to come. When you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who's oppressing you, Sound a blast on the trumpets, then you will be remembered by the Lord your God and rescued from your enemies. Also at your times of rejoicing, your appointed festivals and new moon feasts, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and they will be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so two separate events here that God is describing. I want to take them one by one. When you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who's oppressing you, Sound a blast on the trumpets. Then you will be remembered by the Lord your God and rescued from your enemies. So let me ask you something. When you're going through certain things, do you remember the covenant that you have with God? Do you remember, you know, the Lord says that if I repent or that he doesn't send grief willingly. So if he's sending it, he's sending it to communicate with me. And I need to understand it from that perspective. Or do you just go to him and plead with him to send it away? Because God has established certain ways of communicating with him. When you blow this trumpet, when you're being oppressed and you blow this trumpet, you'll be remembered by the Lord your God. Now, a lot of people will take that context and they'll say, well, all I need to do is blow a trumpet and then he's going to remember me. Let me go get, let me go get a shofar. Let me go get, you know, whatever it is. God was God established things in building blocks, didn't he, throughout the Bible? So you might look at something in the Old Testament, like here in Numbers, and think, well, that's easy. I'll just get I'll just get a trumpet and I'll just blow that trumpet, then God's gonna rescue me. Kind of like the way that people treat things when they say, Well, whatever you pray in Jesus' name, then you'll be given it. And so they 
pray for things and then they scream in the name of Jesus. How well does it work? Because I tried it when I was an idiot in counterfeit Christianity and it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because the name that God gave his son is not a verbal name. It's a cause. It's a reason. It's a purpose. And that's the reason why scripture says you keep praying for things, but you're praying with your own motives. And that's why you're not receiving. That's why scripture says, whatever you pray in my name, you'll receive, but you need to pray with the right motives. So if what I'm saying is correct, that you're praying in God's will, then that means you're rending your heart to what God wants. So is God not pleased to give you what he wants to give you? Now that you have rent your heart to what he wants to give you instead of what your flesh wants to receive, James was rebuking the people for not praying correctly and not having the correct motives. So if it's as easy as simply praying in the name of Jesus, why was he rebuking them? Why was he telling them, hey, this is a heart issue. You need to pray actually in his name, in his will. And so likewise here, I I don't want anyone to mistake this and think, oh, all I need to do is blow a trumpet. Well, there are a lot of other commands that people would have understood here. Like, you need to return to me. You need to repent. You need to understand that everything that is sent in your life is sent by God. He separates the light from the darkness. He creates good and evil. He, the Lord, does all these things. And so what is the example that you see from God's leaders and prophets? You see that when they're in captivity, when judgment has been sent, that they know exactly what they need to do. They know that they need to repent and they know they need to acknowledge what they've done and there needs to be change and there needs to be commitment to change and personal examination. I mean, you look at you look at the prayers of Nehemiah and Daniel. There's not a mere my bad. I'll do better. There's an actual examination of personal accountability. Then there's an admission of what they've done wrong. And there is demonstration that they understand what needs to change, what they need to do differently. And immediately they take action to do differently. So then there's change. There's the fruit of repentance. So while God may have established that at this time you're blowing a trumpet, the fulfillment of understanding is that when you call on God, when you blow that trumpet, that you know what you need to do. And the scriptures demonstrate that people knew what they needed to do. You know what? Today, they don't know what they need to do. And when I suggest these things to them, like you need to repent, like you need to stop going to idols to fix you and heal you and psychoanalyze you, you need to go to the word and understand what God has established or you'll never heal. When I suggest those things, you know what I'm told? to stop this destructive teaching. Am I not speaking on the word? When did God's word become destructive? When did they start to have disdain for what God has established? This isn't my word. This isn't my message. I'm teaching what God has taught me by his spirit and his word. What is destructive about this? This was established in order to develop a relationship, communication, because you're in the flesh and God's in the spirit. And he wanted to give you a way of communicating with him. As time goes on and you have his spirit and a way to communicate from your spirit to his spirit, this becomes an internalized process. So you may not pick up a shofar or a trumpet and blow that thing, but you call on him in the spirit. He calls you to your spirit, from his spirit to your spirit, from your spirit to his spirit. And this is the relationship that he wants to have with you. But he had to establish some basic fundamental ways of understanding in the natural how that relationship is going so that you could understand an internalized relationship with him. 
The second context is in verse 10. Also at your times of rejoicing, your appointed festivals and new moon feasts, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and they are to be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. Two things that I hear here. Number one, at your times of rejoicing. And number two, that these are to be a memorial for you before your God. I want to understand this context of memorial. I think I understand it, but I want to make sure that that translation is correct and that I fully understand what is it that God is establishing in these offerings. What does he want us to understand about them as a memorial? So I'm going to go to Blue Letter Bible. I'm going to type in Numbers 1010. When it opens up to Numbers 1010, I'm going to click Tools at the left. And I'm going to go down to where it says memorial. Now, this is going to default to uh, King James, but it does. And sometimes it uses different language. But here it does have the word memorial and it's the phrase for a memorial. And it's Strong's H2146. And the word is zikaron. It's the Hebrew word H. That's the H. It's a simple thing, but I didn't know this when I first started looking at Strong's, that if it starts with Strong's G, it's Greek. If it starts with H, it's Hebrew. Simple enough, right? And the outline of biblical usage here is memorial, reminder, and remembrance. So I know that the context of this word is exactly what I thought it would be, which is to be remembered or memorialized. Why would you want to remember or memorialize fellowship offerings or burnt offerings? You know, in Leviticus 24, God talks about that table of bread on which there are 12 loaves of bread and they're separated into two piles. And this is a memorial portion. So it's pointing forward to something. And it just so happens that it's pointing forward to the two witnesses who come from the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each And by the way, the 12 tribes of Israel are not an ethnic category. When you are engrafted into the commonwealth of Israel, you belong to a tribe of Israel. Now, that's not something that happened when Leviticus 24 was established, but it was something that he said, you're to do this from generation to generation. This is a lasting ordinance wherever you live. There are things that counterfeit Christians like to say, oh, those have already been fulfilled. Therefore, we don't do them anymore. And yet God has said, you are to do this from generation to generation as a lasting ordinance wherever you live and teach your children to do the same, you know, so that they can continue doing this from generation to generation as a lasting ordinance wherever they live. And yet when he established them, they were already fulfilled. The festival of tabernacles was already fulfilled. The Passover, the first Passover already fulfilled. Why did he continue having the Israelites observe it if counterfeit Christianity is correct that when something is fulfilled, it's abolished. You remember that Jesus said, I haven't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. How did we end up? I mean, he couldn't have been more clear. How did we end up saying, oh, well, fulfillment means abolishment. How do we so conveniently gloss over the fact that he was very specific? The reality is that God has established things that he wants us to remember that have happened in the past. And he's also established things that he wants us to remember that are going to happen in the future. Leviticus 24, the table of bread is something that is actually happening right now that is representing the two witnesses testifying who are going to lose their lives, who have not loved their lives so much as to drink from death. And they're testifying, they're witnessing, represents The second criteria that's required in order to triumph over the devil and kick him out of heaven. Kick him out of the heavenly realms. Do you think God wanted to memorialize that? Well, God talks about you as an offering, as a sacrifice to him, to God and the lamb. And so when he says you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and they will be a memorial for you before your God, I am the Lord your God. What do you think he's remembering or memorializing here? See, God is not flippant about what it is that he set you apart to do. You are very important to him in his kingdom. Just because you didn't deserve this, just because you couldn't have chosen yourself or set yourself apart, 
does not mean that in his righteousness that he is flippant about what he set you apart to suffer for the name, for the kingdom. And so in his righteousness and in his love, he is honoring us just the way that he also honors his son by having us continue to observe the Passover, just the way as he honors the significance of his son's sacrifice and in the extension of the covenant in Passover. It kind of gives this aspect of God, helps you to appreciate this aspect of his character that is quite sentimental. And so as you see him in that light as being more sentimental and establishing a memorial, a remembrance of each and every one of us. Does that make you feel closer to him? Because that's what the Festival of Trumpets is about. A relationship between the one blowing the trumpet and the one hearing it. On both sides, guys. On the part of the Father and on your part. You listen to him and he listens to you. God respects those who respect him. He honors those who honor him. That's what the word demonstrates, doesn't it? Numbers 29. On the first day of the seventh month, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. It is a day for you to sound the trumpets. As an aroma pleasing to the Lord, offer a burnt offering of one young bull, one ram, and seven male lambs, a year old, all without defect. With the bull, offer a grain offering, three-tenths of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with olive oil, and the ram, and with the ram, two-tenths. And with each of the seven lambs, one-tenth. Include one male goat as a sin offering to make atonement for you. These are in addition to the monthly and daily burnt offerings with their grain offerings and drink offerings as specified. They are a food offering presented to the Lord, a pleasing aroma. Now, sometimes in the past when I've read about the offerings and the, you know, the lamb and the ram and the blah, 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 blah. That's kind of how I've read it. Like the blah, 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 blah. And I've had to correct myself. And, you know, I'm saying this because I'm just as human as you are and you're just as human as I am. So you may have felt this way too. Like, oh, I just want to skip over that part. But here's the thing. God established these offerings. And when he established these offerings, he established that each person was to bring an offering in keeping with what they have. So I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you might through his poverty become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first, not only to give, but also to to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. According to your means. Okay, so people give in accordance with their means. That's what was established in, in uh, bringing, you know, sacrifices to God, bringing offerings to God. And it's the same now. So he says, for the, if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to the one who has, not according to the one who does not have. Our desire is not that others might be, might be relieved while you're hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. So that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Now, Paul is not talking about sacrifices uh, that were being brought to the temple because this is after Jesus passed, after he'd been sacrificed and, uh, and rose. So he's not talking about sacrifices, but he is using an understanding that was established with sacrifice in order to help people to understand how they need to give to the poor. In sacrifices, you would sacrifice a lamb, a ram, a goat, according to if you had more. If you had less, then you're going to sacrifice in accordance with what you have, in accordance with your means. A dove, a pigeon. So everyone learned how to provide an offering in accordance with what they uh, with what they had. And this is continued in terms of financial provision that you continue to care for the poor. Just as God said in the Old Testament, there are to be no poor among you. You need to take care of each other. How can you see that a brother or sister is in need and not provide for them? The love of God can't be in you. But this also has significance regarding 
what we've been given spiritually. To whom much is given, much is required. And that's not just about finances, though it includes finances. It also includes your spiritual gifts, your spiritual wisdom, the testimony that God has built in you. You have to go share that. You have to be used as an offering. God has not given you gifts to go babble into the air, has he? So I discern that those are not gifts. God has not given you gifts to go show off. He has given you gifts in order to serve him. Someone in Sabbath assembly this afternoon shared a scripture that I thought was just so important. It was such deep understanding that God had given her. She shared Joel 2, and I'm going to start in verse 13. Joel is saying, return to God, return to God. And it says, rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Now, when you hear that, who knows, he may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. When you read that, do you actually read that that's for the Lord your God? Or do you read, oh, he's offering something to us? (laughs) Because I think most of us read it that way. And I'm guilty of that too. Like, you know, it never... He, did, he didn't give me the wherewithal. He didn't uh, alert me to what that actually means. But he did today through unique. He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. So this is a blessing to you. But the blessing is grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. So it's actually the offering that's being given to him is also a blessing to you. Do you think of it that way? Or... In our carnal insatiability, are we like, oh, he's going to do something for me, me, me. And it's going to look like, a, you know, what, whatever people are calling abundance and prosperity, right? But actually, grain offerings and drink offerings, when he's talking about an offering, it's an offering to him. And are those offerings who have received these gifts, who have proven worthy of a trust, these are offerings to him. And in us sharing with one another... We're actually offering something to him because what can we give to him directly? Nothing, really. If we love him, then we will love each other. If we love him, then we will share what he's been doing in us. Not go take a gift for ourselves, you know, babbling into the air, calling ourselves prophet so that we can receive glory from other people. No prophet ever received glory here. When was Jesus glorified, guys? When he died on the cross. You're not going to receive worldly glory. Too many people calling themselves prophet, saying that they, I don't know, someone said a while back that their BFF held the office of prophet. Where's that in the in the Bible? I mean, said it like such a an esteemable thing. I mean, it is esteemable, but it's not esteemable in that way, in that carnal, fleshy way of like, look at me, my best friend is a psychic. I'm sorry, but if your best friend suddenly became a prophet and you're close to them, it might just be that they've been put in your life to rebuke you. Prophets don't have besties, sorry. Because the word says, let this people turn to you, you must not turn to them. And so there's a certain amount of distance that God's prophets have to have with every single person, including their own family members. Because at any minute, God might use them in order to correct that person. It is a very lonely life being an actual prophet. And they have to go through the pain of the people closest to them, possibly rejecting them or having that discord until God brings them into agreement. It's a painful role. People don't love hearing from what God's prophets have to say. So let's bring this back to the point that I'm trying to make, which is that the memorial portion, that the memorial blowing the trumpets over these offerings was to memorialize the sacrifices that were going to be made in the future by God's people. Because now you understand that we don't offer sacrifices in rams and bulls. That's not what God desired. He desires our sacrifice, the sacrifice of our hearts, the sacrifice of our life, which we will give him. And in his righteousness, he has memorialized that in advance. So that when you see rams, lambs, goats, pigeons, doves, whatever it is that you see, bread, 
drink offerings. When you see that, what you should understand is that each person gives in accordance with what they've been given. Each person is also giving in accordance with what they've proven worthy to be given. It's a huge honor to have the greater gifts. And I want you to understand something. Paul talked about tongues were like a lower level kind of, that was something that people were given. By the way, all it means is languages. They were able to speak different languages so that they could speak to others throughout the world. Tongues are not as common anymore if people are even actually speaking languages as enabled by the Holy Spirit. I don't believe they are. That I Certainly that babble is not, is not tongues. No one's there to interpret what you're saying. And by interpret, that just means to understand what in the world you are saying. In the book of Acts, people were, you know, they were saying, oh, aren't these people from Galilee? Why is it then that we understand what they're saying in our own language? That's all that was being said. Not this Shanda, Boko, Bo, Bo, Bo. People falling over and doing, I mean, that's for show. That's for them. That is literally doing nothing for the kingdom of God, but creating disorder and chaos and confusion. And I know what spirit does that. Languages edify you because you understand what the heck you're saying. You know, the number one thing that people say to, have said to me in the past when they claim to be speaking in tongues, speaking that nonsense, when I ask them, so what do tongues do for you? Oh, they edify me. Really? How? Do you understand what you're saying? No, they just edify me. They don't know how to answer it. It's pathetic. Why hasn't it occurred to anyone to ask the question, why'd God give me this if I don't even know what the heck I'm saying? No one has the sense to ask that question in all these years that they've been doing this nonsense. Now listen, tongues were provided because Jews had God's word and Jews needed to speak different languages in order to share the gospel with Gentiles. That make a little better sense now? It's not needed now the way it was needed at one time because now God's people are scattered throughout the nations and they speak the languages of those nations. But Paul said, desire the greater gifts. So if you have a lower level gift, the expectation is that you're gonna continue to grow and to be used in God's kingdom as you prove worthy. You need to be healed as an individual. You need to preside over what over the responsibilities God has given you, the house he's given you, the children, the spouse, those he's placed in your care. You need to walk in that correctly because you haven't been walking in, in it correctly. And he's going to teach you how to do that. And when you've proven worthy, then you'll receive gifts to serve in his house. But you cannot serve in his house if your own house is not in order. You cannot manage his house if you're not managing your own house well. And all overseers must be above reproach, which is not above questioning. It is above questionable behavior. So though you might be a little pigeon or a dove right now, because that's what you have to give, because that's the point at which you've been built. You desire the greater gifts. You desire to be a lamb, a ram, and a bull so that you have more to give. And you continue to do that until the day of the Lord. Because as you're being purified, made spotless and refined, you're gonna continue to be tested and to be brought into the purpose for which God set you apart because that's your covenant. So you continue on that upward trajectory of growth. You don't become lazy. You don't become complacent. You don't start thinking, oh, I'm saved, look at me. Because none of us have been saved yet, guys. We're working out our salvation. Jesus hasn't come for us yet. That's salvation. When you're saved from all this and the curse. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have said things like, I have to do the very things I teach you, lest after preaching, I disqualify myself. How could he be disqualified if he's already received salvation? No, Paul understood that he was working out his salvation. Continuing on, Numbers 31, verse 6, Moses sent them into battle, a thousand from each tribe, along with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest who took with him articles from the sanctuary and the trumpets for signaling. So we know that trumpets signal. That continues to go along with this theme of communication. Joshua 6, 4, have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark on the seventh day 
march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. Okay, an announcement. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Again, this is, this is them taking, you know, taking Jericho. And what's happening? A communication between them and God. Remember what he said, sound the trumpet and he will respond. Verse six, so Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. So what is God demonstrating? He's demonstrating that he responds to them. And he ordered the army advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets and the Ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. Okay, so what did the Ark of the Lord's covenant um, represent? It represented the presence of God. So now there's an association between the presence of God being right there because, you know, the thing is like, God knows that this is difficult for us to conceive that, that, that he being one that we cannot, we can't see with our eyes and, and touch and, and converse with like you and I might converse. He knows that that's difficult for us, but he's established it in this way so that they're able to conceive of something that they can see and attribute, okay, God's presence is right there. Well, we're supposed to understand that God's presence is right here, right inside of us. So this is an understanding that God is continuing to build, first through physical symbolism, then through spiritual. So anyone who says that all they need is the new, is, is the new uh, Testament, they don't need to understand the Old Testament. They don't understand the New Testament. You can't. How can you? You just eliminated the building blocks by which God established, you know, what God established in order to teach you spiritual things. And this is why there are so many people trying to put together a pu puzzle pieces by their own carnality because they are too lazy to go back into the Old Testament and rend their heart to what God established and what that means to us today. They take a word in the Old Testament and then put it together with one in the New and then make up a story around it. How many times does God talk about first fruits? Well, he doesn't necessarily talk about first fruits in the same context every time. So when he refers to Jesus as the first fruits, and then you see that there's the offering of first fruits. But what God has said is when you enter the land I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, this is what you are to do. Has nothing to do with the context of Jesus. So why is there this narrative in counterfeit Christianity that the offering of first fruits was three days after the lamb was sacrificed. What, what are we talking about here? No, in Joshua, the offering of first fruits took place after the last day of the festival of unleavened bread, which is also part of the Passover. The offering of first fruits takes place after the Sabbath. All of these things need to be true. And wh why that narrative? Because someone decided to, to put a bunch of pieces together without fully understanding, without rending their heart, without reading this, without, you know, rending their hearts to what God has established in the Old Testament so that we can understand the New Testament. And there are some really difficult things to understand in the Old Testament. I tell you all the time, you cannot understand the Old Testament without understanding the New, and you can't understand the New Testament without understanding the Old. Verse 9, the armed guard marched ahead of the priests, who blew the trumpets and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time, the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. It's kind of funny. It seems kind of weird, right? Like, why, why are you guys doing this? I mean, they're like announcing themselves for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the, sh the city. The city and all that are in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared. 
because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of, the, of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpets sounded, the army shouted, and at the shout of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. So there's this relationship between God and his people. And there's also some kind of funny things that God has us doing that don't totally make sense. But he has us, or they might not make sense to us at the time, but he has us doing them. And sometimes he reveals later why he had us do that. And also, I think it's important to note that he's building our trust. He's building our faith. You know, when you're doing this for six days, you might be wondering, is he really going to do this? Or am I just like a, is he just making a fool out of me? But throughout that entire process, there's a communication between you and God. God has me doing some things that are really foolish to the world. He had me live on my retirement, my savings. He's had me keeping a building and a property that I can't afford. He has me continuing to stay here. Do you think that I'm white knuckling it through this? That I'm just, you know, okay, well, he'll provide. Guys, let me tell you something. I bug him every single day and every minute of every day. I am constantly pulling on him because there is no way that I could survive what I'm doing right now. In faith, there's no way that I could survive if I was white, if I were white knuckling it. I would implode every single day. I've got to do something to relate with him, even in doing, you know, doing these videos when he builds a message in me and then, or, or even, you know, just says, okay, go open your mouth and speak. When I see the glory of the Lord being revealed, when I'm speaking things that I didn't even know, because I, I, I do that on a, on a daily basis, or better yet, I should say he does that through me on a daily basis. And when I see what he's doing, then I, I feel peace. I feel restored again. And I'm able to remind myself, I know who he is. I know who I am. I know what he has done in me. I know what he has promised me. I know what he has built. I know that that's not my wisdom, that that's not my understanding coming out of my mouth, that that is not the result, that the message is not the result of a bunch of puzzle pieces that I put together because I wouldn't even know where to start. I'm not even that good at puzzles to begin with. Judges 3.27, when he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with him leading them. Again, this trumpet is being used to announce, and it's also being used um, to instruct the Israelites, come follow me, because this is the thing that Ehud, I don't even know how to say his name, E-H-U-D, this is the first thing that he said, follow me. For the Lord has given, you, given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. So the Israelites are setting out. Again, it's communication. It's announcing the instructions. I'm going to skip through a few of these, like, you know, in Judges 634, because we've covered these topics. And I just want to kind of skip ahead a little bit in order to see if there's any other context, context that we might look at to understand these trumpets. What I can see in Judges 7 is that they're blowing the trumpets and they're saying for the Lord and for Gideon. And when they blow the trumpets, God responds, just like his promise in Numbers. Consistently, you see that he's responding, throwing them, their enemies into confusion, throwing their enemies into panic. But now he's faithful to those who are faithful to him. It's not like you can just take a trumpet and call on him and, well, you, you blew the you blew the right notes. You blew the trumpet just the right way for God to respond to you. That's not how it works. All right, I'm going to fast forward a little bit to the prophets. Zechariah 9.14 says, Then the Lord will appear over them. His arrow will flash like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet. He will march out, march in the storms of the south. And the Lord Almighty will shield them. They will destroy and overcome with sling stones. They will drink and roar as with wine. They will be like... Be full like a bowl, used for sprinkling the corners of the altar. Okay, so what what they're now describing 
is God going before us? And this is really what he's established all throughout this time that the Israelites have been blowing these trumpets. All that time they've been blowing these trumpets and they've been seeing that God is fighting for them, that God is conforming things for them. And now we start seeing in the prophets, the Lord is going to go before you. He's going to march out before you. In the Psalms, it says 40, uh, Psalm 47, 5, God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. And then in 150 verse 3, he says, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Okay, so now the trumpets are being used as an instrument in order to praise him. Still, again, relationship with God. Isaiah 18, 3, all you people of the world, you who live on the earth, when a banner is raised on the mountains, you will see it. And when a trumpet sounds, you will hear it. 27, 13, and in that day, a great trumpet will sound. Those who were perishing in Assyria and those who were exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. Okay, so announcement in Isaiah 27, 13. And then in 58, 1, Isaiah is talking about shouting aloud and actually using your voice like a trumpet, raising your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. And so why is he doing that? In order to call them into fasting. In order to call them back to return to God. Jeremiah 4, 5. Announce in Judah and proclaim in, in Jerusalem and say, Sound the trumpet throughout the land. Cry aloud and say, Gather together. Let us flee to the fortified cities. Okay? An announcement. Hey, we need to all get on the same page. Let's return to the Lord. Although here in this particular context, it's saying disaster from the north. So it's announcing actually disaster. Jeremiah 4, 19. Oh, my anguish, my anguish. I writhe in pain. Oh, the agony of my heart. My heart pounds within me. I cannot keep silent, for I have heard the sound of the trumpet. I have heard the battle cry. Disaster follows disaster. The whole land lies in ruins. In an instant, my tents are destroyed, my shelter in a moment. Okay, so the, the trumpet is being heard as a battle cry. Listen, relationship with God is not all whispering sweet nothings in your ear. It's also declaring judgment, raising the battle cry. Jeremiah 41, I'm sorry, 421. How long must I see the battle standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? My people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. Poor Jeremiah, you hear what he's saying? How long must I see the battle standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? Listen, this is what I'm telling you guys right now, okay? I feel that at, at the core of my soul. How long must I see the battle standard and hear the sound of the trumpet and tell you how long must I communicate this to you that these are the things that are coming, that these are the things that you need to do and no one respond. And yet in Ezekiel, God makes it very clear what his people must do, what his prophets must do. They must speak the message that he tells them to speak, whether the people listen or they fail to listen and the people will not listen because they do not listen to him. So here's a warning. It's a warning. You realize that when Ezekiel swallows that scroll and it tastes sweet in his mouth, it's because these are the words of God. But then he goes in the anger and bitterness of his spirit. Why? Because they don't listen. So it's sweet that God speaks to us. But the fact that people don't listen makes it bitter. When John swallows the scroll in Revelation 10, it's sweet in his mouth, but it's sour in his stomach. You understand what's, been, what's being revealed there? God's prophets are not enjoying the work that they're doing. They hate their lives every single day. And believe me, when I go to rest, I am going to rest. I am going to rest because this is hard. No one cares and they're angry and they fight against you. As though th this is, these are my words. This is my message, my destructive message. Jeremiah six seventeen. I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But you said, we will not listen. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Is the message coming from Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, anybody else? Is it coming from them or is it coming from God? Jeremiah 42, 14. And if you say, no, we will go and live in Egypt where we will not see war or hear the trumpet 
or be hungry for bread. Then hear the word of the Lord, you remnant of Judah. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. If you are determined to go to Egypt and you do go and settle there, then the sword you fear will overtake you there and the famine you dread will follow you into Egypt and there you will die. Indeed, all who are determined to go to Egypt to settle there will die by the sword, famine, and plague. Not one of them will survive or escape the disaster I will bring on them. There are many ways that God tries to get your attention. Many ways that he tries to get your attention. I have told you many of them in your dreams, in your afflictions, in your memories, in your uh, feelings, in your circumstances. All of these things God is speaking into. There is nothing in your life. I don't care what psychology has told you about trauma and how that wasn't supposed to happen. No, everything has happened the way it was supposed to, the way that God has intended to build you. And if you are going to reject being built, then God's voice is going to get louder and he's going to send more grief in order to get your attention. And then eventually he's going to send his prophets to speak to you and you're probably not going to listen to them either because no one ever does. And then will come the judgment. That is the reason why the witnesses are here before the Antichrist reign. I'm going to keep going because I just feel like it's important for, you know, for us to look at all of these contexts. I know that it's a very long video. I mean, you might choose to listen to it in, in two separate uh, times, depending on your schedule, but I'm going to keep going. Ezekiel 7, 14, they've blown the trumpet. They've made all things ready, but no one will go into battle for my wrath is on the whole crowd. Ezekiel 33, 2 through 4. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, when I bring the sword against the land and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people. What does the trumpet do? It warns the people. Then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed the warning and the sword comes to take their life, their blood will be on their own head. I hope you hear that because your blood's not going to be on my head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. So what do you think I'm going to do? Do you think that when God shows me something that I'm going to be like, oh, but I might hurt their feelings. Actually, I'm going to be very honest with you. I do, I do feel that. I do feel concerned for your feelings, but I feel more concerned about my role with God and doing what, I, what he has set me apart to do. You know, frankly, it's not even so much that I feel like, oh, I'm not going to have their blood on my head. It, it, it isn't. That's not really what I, what I necessarily feel, and I don't, I don't think that would be the right attitude anyway. The attitude that God ha causes me to have is I'm more concerned about their salvation. I'm concerned that if I don't say something, that a person will fall, that they will not have been, that I will not have been used in order to give them an opportunity to be saved. And so truly what I feel in my heart is I don't want to waste a single day and I don't want to waste a single bit of information that God gives me. I want to make sure that everyone knows what they're choosing. How can I know the things that God tells me and not say anything to anybody else as though I'm the only one who matters? You know, I've known people who do that, by the way. I've known people who were hanging out in the assembly thinking that they were saved, and they, they didn't even bother to go and tell their parents, their children, their own children. They had to be told to tell their children that this is what is going on at this point in history. That is shameful. It's despicable. How can anybody think they're saved or being saved when they don't even care to tell their children, be a watchman for their children, that here they are over here, you know, over here listening to the things I'm saying, try to spare themselves from the fires of hell, but, you know, their children, well, whatever. They were rotten kids anyway, right? That is sick. The love of God is not in a person like that. In fact, God says that those who don't, do not provide for their own family are worse than an unbeliever. Those who do not provide for their own house are worse than than an unbeliever. We need to go out and share that spiritual food. I care about you as a stranger. How can someone not care about their own flesh and blood? Hosea 8.1, put the trumpet to your lips. An eagle is over the house of the Lord because the people have broken my covenant and rebelled against my law. Man, you know, it's so sad as you go on in the word, the trumpet more and more is not 
I don't know if you're noticing this, but is less a symbol of rejoicing, less a symbol of relating positively with the Lord, and now is more and more a trumpet of warning, of calling you in. Hey, guys, hey, remember me, the one who made the covenant with you? Ah, it's so sad. Okay, my alarm actually just went off because we have an assembly tonight, and I totally forgot about it. We have a regular assembly on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in order to um, just touch base about things that are going on in the world and what it is that we're seeing and where we, you know, understand the times so that Israel knows what it ought to do, right? So I'm going to park it right there. I think that we got to, um, you know, the thing that God just keeps bringing me back to is this is relationship between us and that this trumpet has been established in the covenant for us to listen to him, for us to perceive what it is that he's doing, and for him to respond to us if, indeed, we've been listening to him. So I hope that you'll, you'll take that and understand and, and really, you know, spend some time with the, um, the sentimental nature of God's heart and his desire to communicate with us, to be in communication. You know, a lot of times we're complaining that, oh, I'm not hearing from God and I'm not this and that. It, 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 we're complaining about that, but it, we, have, we don't take the time at all to perceive what he's doing. What Trump, how is he blowing these trumpets in our lives? How is he trying to get our attention and call us in to be with him? Yesterday, he was afflicting me and I was quite frustrated. And I like spilled something and I was like, really, really? If you want to deal with me, then deal with me. And I had an opportunity right then and there to just stop and start journaling. But I, I, my frustration level was very high yesterday. And I didn't take those opportunities and uh, until later in the day. I did end up taking them. But it, it seemed like there was just like one thing after another. And, and I was just so aggravated. The sooner we return, he will relent. He does not give grief willingly. He will relent. Please take some time to understand the sentimental nature of God, what he has established in this covenant, and what this festival of trumpets means. It doesn't mean all of the superficial nonsense that you have learned in counterfeit Christianity. This is, we went through scripture. We defined it based on scripture. This is what God has, has determined. This is what he has established with regard to what a trumpet is. It is truly relationship between us and him. Please discern this message with God.